aim is Dr. Marie Kerrin, and I am a lecturer here at Kent Law School. So it's lovely to uh, be able to welcome you here today um, to discuss legal and the ethics and the morality of lawyers. So this is a bit of a passion subject for me. So as, as a lecturer at Kent Law School, I teach on lots of different things. So if you do join us in September, uh, you'll no doubt uh, see me around at some point because I teach on things like introduction to the English legal system. I teach on a critical introduction to law. Um, I also uh, teach on introduction to property sometimes. Um, but my passion subject, the thing that I'm really interested in, is all things philosophy of law. So one of the modules that I convene that you would be able to take later on in your studies is legal ethics exploring the ethics of lawyers and lawyering um, it is a wonderful module uh, I, I hope that uh, by the end of today's session you will agree having given you a little bit of a snapshot of some of the things that we are going to be discussing so that's a little bit from me let me let me uh, allow my colleague to introduce herself to you too so hello, my name is Lucinda Griffiths and I'm also a lecturer here at Kent Law School and I teach on subjects such as criminal law, alternative dispute resolution, so like mediation and negotiation, as well as of course on legal ethics. I'm also involved in our lawyering skills programme at Kent. So this is why I'm actually really interested in some of the topics that we discuss in legal ethics. You know, notably, can a good lawyer also be a moral person and you know what role does ethics play in the relationship that you as a potential lawyer may have with your client so marie i think you're doing the slides aren't I am you? indeed fantastic okay so what we're going to do today is to introduce you to some of the key moral and ethical questions surrounding legal practice exploring some of the dilemmas that lawyers face in their roles and why they face them and you know what they can or should do about them so to do this we're going to introduce you to some of you know just some of the basic ideas around what legal ethics is before taking you through the case of the washington torture lawyers and we're going to ask ourselves can torture ever be justified. And we're going to do this within the context of legal ethics. So the first thing that we want you to do is I'm going to ask you a question. And that question is, when you think of legal ethics, what kind of things come to mind? So in order to get your answers, what I'd like you to do is to open up another web page. And in that web page, I'd like you to go to the following address. So www.menti.com. So that's M-E-N-T-I. So once you've got to the web page, it should ask you for a code. And that code is 56248722. Okay, 56248722. Now, sorry, I'm sorry, listen to if you if you look on the screen, uh, the code is actually wrong. updated. So the one that you have read out is not the current <laughs> one. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Do you have the current? So the current one is two eight six eight seven six eight seven, and it oh, is fantastic. on the screen for everybody to see as well. But if you're in different tabs, uh, just to confirm, we're going to menti.com, uh, m i m e n t i dot com, and we're using the code two eight six eight seven six eight seven it's old eyes marie i can barely <laughs> i can barely see the screen in front of me yes <laughs> okay right so again that question when you think of legal ethics what kind of things come to mind what is legal ethics so we're going to give you a couple of minutes to see how many responses you can give okay I'll, I'll add to um, if you do have any trouble with it, just pop your answers as well in the chat mm -hmm. um, and we can we can also discuss things in the chat. I think the chat, just to confirm with everyone, I think we can see your responses, mm -hmm. but not everybody else can see your responses. So we will if you use the chat, um, we will just uh, read things out, but we'll keep everything anonymous so we won't include your name in it.
I feel we need music here, Marie. Like do, 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 do. We don't have a Kent Law School theme tune. I feel this is something we need to work on. That would be excellent. For these, for these moments that, that we have, that's right. <laughs> So I can see that we've got a, a few people that have responded um, already, um, nowhere near as many of the people who are actually in the room. Um, so we'll just give you like a couple more seconds to put anything in, the first thing that springs to mind, um, and then we can crack on. Great. Oh, we've got something in the chat. This is good. So we'll, okay, well, let's wait till the, for the Mentimeter results and then. Cool. Okay, so. <clears throat> Let me see if I can share our Mentimeter results. Hooray, oh, it works. Hey, that's it. And it's big enough that we can see it. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's have a look. So the majority of you talked about integrity. So when you think about legal ethics, it's about the integrity of lawyers. We've also got people picking up on this idea of morals, which is really important, especially when we think about what ethics actually are. We're seeing professionalism, which is good. Again, you know, legal ethics, is it just about sort of a legal code? You know, is it just about the, the solicitor's regulations? So that's really important that there's that, that recognition of that. Again, morality within the law, justice as well. That's quite an interesting one, isn't it, Marie? I think that, that there's that relationship there. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, in people picking up on this idea of the morality of the law, because one of the things that we will look at today a little bit, actually, um, but what we also are really interested in exploring in legal ethics is, mm. is there a difference between like the morality of the lawyers versus the morality of the laws in thinking about legal ethics? And we'll definitely be coming on to that later. Um, somebody else, Lucinda, in the chat has said that ethics regarding the use of the law, although people believe that legal ethics is about the ethics of lawyers, which I believe that it is not. And so again, that is touching on what I was just talking about there. Um, um, is it about the ethics of the lawyers themselves or is it about the ethics of lawyering and, 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 and who creates that who who sets what the the ethics are you know exactly. and you need to be moral to be a lawyer I mean that's that's a big question that we look at. <laughs> it's a huge question that we look at we're not going to be able to cover that today but it's a it's like you say it's really interesting that you guys are like picking up look right or wrong you know the codes of conduct these are all ideas that you know that we can associate with this idea of legal ethics for one of the assessments on this module uh, on the legal ethics module at kls um this year we actually asked the question can a good lawyer be a good person? And so that was a very interesting essay for the students to be exploring. Um, so good. So I think that we've got a, a decent array there of um, thinking about and reflecting on what we think legal ethics is. So firstly, what we want to be doing in today's session is before we dive into the legal side of the ethics we want to just pause and make sure that we're comfortable with the ideas around what actually ethics is um, and what we saw already on the slides is that people were think uh, in the responses that people were thinking about morality right so ethics is sometimes used interchangeably with morality or to refer to a moral code of conduct so it's good to keep in mind what we mean by both of them and how they can relate to one another, yeah? So when we think about morality in terms of the subject of ethics, um, Day here, John Day uh, on the screen, is encouraging us to think about general standards rather than those specific to a given context or a given society. So we're thinking about universality here, something that should apply anywhere and everywhere. It's not just like context specific. Moral theories then are often uh, concerned with prescribing action. And so one of the things we're thinking about when we're prescribing action is we're thinking about what we ought to do or how we ought to behave. Um, and this idea of ought is significant then when we're thinking about ethics and legal ethics specifically, because we can, for example, explore the difference between what something is and what it ought to be and whether we can ascertain what something ought to be by determining what it is. And so when we're thinking about the morality of these things, 
are we thinking about it just in terms of well this is the way that life is it's a universal thing morality can be a universal thing or are we thinking about it in terms of everything is relative and morality can change and adapt over time and what we ought to do in one situation might be different to how we ought to behave in another situation um, and we can see that as well through the um, quotation that we have about ethics on the screen here from day where he says that his primary aim of ethics is to term to determine how one ought to live and what actions one ought to do in the conduct of one's life and so when we're thinking about legal ethics later on we'll be coming onto that and working out how that works when we're thinking about lawyers as, as ethical beings right so before we get into the legal side of things then it's helpful for us to reflect a little bit more on these different ideas around morality just so we're comfortable with what we're thinking about so we're going to introduce you to two broad but very differing ideas around morality. So the first one is what we would call deontology. So this is very much concerned with duty and deon from the Greek means duty. And telos actually means goal. So we're thinking about that goal of it being about our duty. So for deontology, the notion of duty then is central to the rightness or wrongness of an action. And it is termed by the action itself rather than by the consequences. So that means I can do a good thing in and of itself. It doesn't matter what the consequences are of my action, as long as the action I performed was good, then if I'm a deontologist, I'm on the right track. By complete contrast, then, we have consequentialism, or what is also known as teleology. And this argues that an action is right if it leads to better outcomes than if the action was not performed. So here we are very much thinking about the consequences of the action and a really commonly known view of consequentialism is utilitarianism and that is the ideas around uh, Jeremy Bentham uh, you probably you might have come across him in your studies already and so that is this idea of the greatest good for the greatest number the consequences of my action are really important so if I'm a deontologist I'm going to be asking questions like how do I know what I should do what is right for me to do and what would be wrong for me to do in a given situation and what principle or rule will tell me what is the right act to do in a situation by contrast, then, if I'm a consequentialist, I'm going to be asking, how do I know what will create the greatest good? Um, will this action create more good than if it was not performed? So I'm thinking about the consequences of the action. Will action A create more good than action B? Which ones will have the best consequences? So hopefully you can see there that the way that morality is conceptualized between deontologists and consequentialists is very, very different. Um, and to really help us understand that, what I'm going to be asking us to do is to reflect on the following scenario. OK, so here, what I want us to do is think about our ideas about morality. Uh, not necessarily those ideas that I've just introduced you to like straight away about consequentialism and deontology, but let's just have a think about this scenario in general. OK, so here you have a scenario, an out of control trolley is traveling down a track heading towards five people. The five people won't be able to move out of the way in time before the trolley strikes. You are standing by the lever that if you pulled it would divert the trolley, i.e. send it in a different way to a different track where only one person would be able to not move out of the way in time. Do you pull the lever? That is the question. So if I don't pull the lever, then five people are going to get severely interest, in, injured or die. If I pull the lever, then I save those five people and only one person gets severely injured or dies. OK, so what I'm going to ask you to do is there is going to be a poll that is going to appear on your screen, uh, hopefully um, uh, at some point now. Oh, beautiful. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kiara, in the background, doing wonderful work. Um, I just want you to answer this question, yes or no. And if you want to elaborate on your answers, just pop those answers in the chat and we can have a discussion about it. OK, so 
just yes or no, do you pull the lever? And then in the chat, expand on your answer, like why have you made that choice, okay? So I'm just gonna give you a couple of seconds for this one because it's just a yes or no, and then we can use the chat to elaborate on our answers, okay? Getting stuff in the chat already, that is good. Good, good. <clears throat> okay, so looking at the poll, so 81% of you said that yes, you would pull the lever and 19% of you said that you wouldn't. So let's just have a look at some of the comments. So some people are saying only one person would get severely injured instead of five. Better to save five lives and sacrifice the one for the single individual. And the interesting, yes, you should pull the lever because you're going to perform an action either way. So you should choose the one which does the least harm. So I think getting a sense from, from these responses is that the majority of you would actually pull the lever. I'm just wondering if there's anybody who said they wouldn't. Let's have a look. I'm interested oh. in um, the person who said that it was an action either way, because yeah. is an inaction an action? Exactly. Because if I do nothing, am I actually acting? In, well, in, in, in law, in certain subjects, actually an omission, not acting, does actually make, make you liable. Actually, somebody's put here, I don't want the moral responsibility of having killed one person. So they're happy to, to, to plow down five. I like that. I, I, we find that students get more violent with each year. <laughs> Fantastic. We had some brutal responses last year. What have we got here? Although the value of human life should be treated the same from the moral standpoint, a utilitarian view is best suited for this response simply because it maximizes the most happiness and welfare. I mean, that's a fantastic response. If that's if that's your view, Re really reflective. And mm. what I what I liked as well about the discussion there, Lucinda, is somebody saying, "Oh well, I'm I'm either going to be responsible for the five lives, or I'm going to re be responsible for the one life." And uh, I think that maybe a deontologist would disagree in the sense that they would they could argue, and and one could argue that actually mm. I'm not I'm not responsible for the five because you know that's that's got nothing to do with me it wasn't my trolley it wasn't my problem <laughs> and I'm not responsible for the five, yeah but I am responsible for the one <laughs> but this is a fantastic maybe five working together would be able to stop the car or reduce the speed now this person is a born lawyer that. <laughs> that is a born lawyer like how am I going to get around that one we are getting some brilliant <laughs> responses in the chat you know but so, again it's looking at that relationship I think between you know the extent of the, the the moral kind of damage that you're doing in making these sorts of decisions. Yes, I, I, absolutely, I, I agree, and and definitely thinking outside the box in terms of what we can can and can't achieve in this. I I really love that, um, and. It, so I've asked this question of students a, a few times in the past, and it doesn't surprise me that there was that kind of 80-20-ish uh, split going on, um, because we're often feel like we should do something to prevent the deaths of so many people, right? Um, so what I want to do is just slightly change up the scenario now, okay? And so instead of the, the five and the one, uh, so we still have the five and the one, sorry, um, but in our new scenario, imagine you now know the person on the tracks. In fact, it's your sister. So that one person that you're going to pull the lever for uh, and kill or severely injure is your sister. There's going to be another poll that is going to come up in a second. And we're asking you the same question, right? Do you pull the lever or not? So five strangers, one person who you know, and they are your sister. Do you pull the lever? So that should come the, chat, the, the poll will appear soon. Should. And in the meantime, please use the chat to expand upon your answers. 
Okay, here comes the poll. Excellent. Do you squish your sister? So we're already getting stuff in the chat, Fab. I'm intrigued to see what the difference is going to be, Marie, if there is one. Me too, especially because the comments in the chat are interesting <laughs> in terms of whether there will be a difference or not. Yeah. <laughs> hey. So just a few more seconds to, uh, to answer uh, this poll. Um, and as I say, uh, add your comments to the chat in terms of why you made the choice that you did. People evaluating how close they are to their siblings. They're sort of like, did, what did their siblings do when they were children? That's these sorts of things. That, you know, how mean was that sister when they were a child? <sighs> Okay, I think the results are gonna come. Oh, interesting. Okay. So this time only 38% of you would pull the lever and 63% of you wouldn't. So it does seem to make a difference. So it comes some of the comments here, not really the closest with my sister. So it's still mostly a numbers principle. Nice comment. My personal connections shouldn't interfere with my decision. Should try and stay objective and value all lives as equal, even if one is my sister. Now that's that's a you know a really kind of objective stand to take. Whether you could take that in the moment, I think is is really interesting. And again, somebody said they answered yes, as even though the person holds a personal relation to me, I would feel greater guilt killing or injuring five than killing my one sister. Perhaps they have more siblings, I don't know. Perhaps there were a couple of spare, but again, looking at this kind of, this balancing act, and, and sometimes that's what kind of moral discussions are, isn't it? it? It's about that balancing act. What else have we got in the chat? I wouldn't pull the lever because they're close to the, to the individual. It would heavily impact my decision. Additionally, pulling it would also affect me personally and, and people around me. So the action does affect the wider community that I personally know of. So that's quite an interesting sort of perspective to take as well. I really love that. And it contrasts beautifully mm. with uh, one of the earlier comments that we actually had in the chat, which was, um, I would still pull the lever because even mm. though I love my sister, um, I would only be harming myself. And I think that this person uh, subsequently, subsequently has gone, has gone well, actually, I'd be harming lots of other people because, you know, we might have a big family. There might be other things involved. It isn't just me. It would affect other people. Um, and I think that one of the interesting things as well is that we're seeing a lot through these comments that we are still holding very much responsibility for killing those five people. <laughs> Right. Them, right and I find yeah. that very very interesting um because you're saying there that you're in action you're choosing not oh. to pull the lever you're not to do something actually still makes you responsible and we could think about that and discuss that a lot in terms of our understanding of morality right and also this there's a comment here about instinct you know instinct would override objective reason and I think that's you know, and this is something that I'm interested in, in that, you know, beyond these kind of theoretical moral decisions, how do you actually make the decisions when it's a client sitting in front of you? You know, when you have to kind of make these moral decisions, you know, what, you know, what actually motivates you, what influences you? So, you know, I think, you know, again, somebody's got even morally, it would be better to, to pull the lever, you know, would you be able to do it because of those personal kind of uh, sort of motivations, you know, and, and, you know, as we keep saying, you know, a good lawyer, you know, should they also be a good person? You know, there is that connection there. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, if, if we were in class right now, um, oh my goodness, we'd probably talk about this for the rest of the hour session, right? Um, and sometimes we do, um, because this is a very interesting scenario to get us into, into the swing of things. Um, however, time means that we've got some other juicy things that we want to go on to discuss. So I am going to move us on from this discussion um, and just say that our answers here to these questions help us to explore what we think about morality. OK, um, what we should do in certain situations. Do we only think about the consequences of our actions or is it important also to reflect on the quality of our actions, too? Yeah. 
if I'm interested in the consequences of my actions, which some of us have been in this discussion, I might be a utilitarian, interested in the greatest good for the greatest number of people. If I'm interested in the quality of my actions, um, then I could be a deontologist. Mm -hmm. So somebody like Immanuel Kant, for example, uh, interested in doing what is right regardless of the consequences. And that is certainly something that has been coming up in the discussion that we have been having. So if that's then ethics, morality, what's the legal bit? What's legal ethics? So legal ethics then is basically like applied ethics. So that is we're thinking about the use of ethics in very specific contexts. It's a form of professional ethics. So we see other forms of professional ethics too. Uh, so for example, medical ethics will be something that I'm sure that most of us will have heard of and what uh, doctors can and cannot do. You know, patient confidentiality, for example, being a key cornerstone of uh, legal ethics, of medical ethics, sorry. So that's a form of professional ethics. So legal ethics is like a form of professional ethics. And we can actually see, as you see from the screen, um, evidence of ethical practice in law dating back to at least the medieval times, though it's certainly evolved a lot since then, right? And in terms of who it applies to and why it has been developed and all those kind of things. Now, um, and in the UK context I'm thinking about, we have standards and requirements that are set out for both whether you're going to be a solicitor or you're going to be a... Um, a barrister. So if I'm a solicitor, then they are set out by the solicitor's regulatory authority in the solicitor's regulatory authority standards and regulations. Um, and if I'm a barrister, then it is set out by the Bar Standards Board um, and they have a handbook and a code of conduct that outlines all of the ethical duties. Mm. I'm not just interested though, and Lucinda isn't just interested though, in thinking about the ethical duties as they're prescribed and written down by the professional bodies, right? We're thinking about ethics more broadly as well in terms of legal ethics. So Daniel Markovitz's quote here is quite interesting in this regard because he seems to be suggesting that legal ethics actually does go beyond what we do in our professional lives. So it's not just about, you know, box ticking in terms of what I need to do in my role. It's very much connected to who we actually are as people. And you could see that his quote here is resonating with what we saw from John Day's quote before, about this idea of a life well, well lived. And so integrating this into a life well lived, me being a good person and me being a good lawyer, very much intertwined for somebody like Daniel Markovitz, who is a, a well-known legal ethicist. So from these ideas then, we can perhaps see that legal ethics is about the way in which lawyers should behave, or is it more prescriptive than that? Is it about just the standards to which lawyers must adhere? So to explore these ideas further, I'm going to hand you over to Lucinda, who is going to introduce us to a very juicy problem. Um, people are asking some questions in the chat. I'm going to come back to them um, at the end, and I promise that we will make time to, to answer, OK? OK. So you can send your questions to the chat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK, so what we want to do now is we want to turn to a second scenario that's just really going to kind of get us thinking about sort of the, the moral sort of underpinnings of these you know, legal decisions. And we're going to look at a real case in the USA. So it's going to be really helpful here to actually think about what we've been saying about the trolley problem. So after the 9-11 attacks, the Bush administration announced a so-called war on terror and they put great pressure on the capture of terrorist suspects. Now, the approach taken was known as the Cheney or 1% doctrine, where if there was even a 1% chance of the terrorists getting a weapon of mass destruction, the US must now treat it as a certainty. Now, this is relevant for the moral argument because it's similar to saying, well, you know, imagine a terrorist has hidden a bomb that will kill hundreds of thousands. This will push people, you know, towards justifying acts that they would normally consider sort of morally wrong. Now, one of the sort of a researcher in legal ethics, David Lubin, he says that 
every interrogation becomes a ticking time bomb case. And ticking time bomb cases are the one situation where many people who would otherwise balk at torture reluctantly accept that breaking the taboo is morally justified. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the case involving the US government lawyers in the attempted justification of torture on detainees. So, you know, Guantanamo Bay and later Abu Ghraib. So if we can just go to the next slide. Thank you, Marie. So in this situation, the CIA was under a huge amount of pressure to target and catch these suspected terrorists. And they were keen to push their interrogation of the suspects in custody that bit further. But, you know, they were faced with, with legal prohibitions. You know, there was certain laws that said they couldn't do certain things when interrogating people suspected of doing something. So, for example, the International Convention Against Torture prohibits torture, which is defined under Article 1 as the intentional infliction of severe physical or mental pain or suffering on someone under official auspice or instigation. Whilst Article 2.2 holds that no exceptional circumstances whatsoever, whether a state of war or a threat of war, internal political instability or any other public emergency may be invoked as a justification of torture. So looking at this, the law looked pretty clear, you know, they cannot torture people. But it is a little bit more grey than that, because well, what do we actually mean by torture? Now, it might seem from the, the above quote that, yes, it's clear what torture is. So, OK, let's suppose there's a question. What do we mean by severe torture? Now, the CIA requested legal advice regarding the kinds of interrogation techniques that they could legally use. You know, taking into account the, the Convention Against Torture, the Geneva Convention, and US law more broadly. And they expressed a, a need to actually push their interrogation further to extreme measures in order to prevent, you know, these future terrorist attacks and to get information from those who actually they suspected had been involved in 9-11. So next slide, please. I sound like Chris Ritty. I, I feel that that's what I'm doing here, it's great. So what we have here, and there was, there was a lot of things going on at the time, but what we want to look at is this idea of what is known as the Bybee torture memo. And this was just one response given when the CIA requested them. And it was given in the form of a memo of legal advice written by Jay Bybee. So the, the memo, the legal advice concluded that inflicting physical pain is torture only if the pain reaches the level associated with organ failure or death. The memo said that inflicting mental pain is lawful unless the interrogator intends it to last months or years beyond the interrogation. Utilizing painful techniques is not torture unless the interrogator intends the pain to be equivalent to the pain accompanying organ failure and death. And that enforcing criminal laws against presidentially authorized torturers would be unconstitutional. As well as you can see there, self-defense includes torturing detainees in the name of national self-defense. And also such interrogation techniques in the name of national security may be legally justifiable through the doctrine of necessity. Now, going back to David Lubin, he noted that modern practice that these memos that come from the Office of Legal Counsel effectively bind the executive, they bind the government, and that makes them quasi-judicial. So, you know, in his interpretation, they need to be taken seriously. So what I want to ask you now is considering the, the advice, the memo that was given, is this legal advice ethical? So hopefully 
a pole is going to come up like magic. Any second now. Aha, there we go. So if we can just get the, I think we're still trying to, to squash the system in this pole. It's the, it's the wrong pole at the moment. We're just waiting for the right pole, don't worry. I think we're doing well with technology. I think it's... I think we're doing, <laughs> considering us. In, in, the, in the meantime, if we're, if we're waiting uh, for the poll, we can always just have people respond in the chat in terms yeah. of why they think it's ethical and why they think it's not ethical. Um, so the question is, is this legal advice given in the Bible torture memo ethical? There we are, the poll is up. So is this legal advice ethical? So very quickly <clears throat> fill in the poll and again, put any comments in the chat. And one thing we could be thinking about as well, I suppose, is obviously we're asking you to just say yes or no here. Do you need any more info? What info would you potentially need in order to be able to answer that confidently? It's going to be interesting to see whether, you know, are you thinking about sort of a deontological position when answering this or consequentialist? You know, or you know, just or even just a gut feeling. What is your your sort of feeling, or whether or not this is ethical or not? Now, do we have the results? Well, most people, seventy five percent of people, are saying that no, it's not ethical advice. So I'd be really interested to see what you have to say about that in the chat. But we still have a substantial amount, 25% of us, um, who uh, um, think that, yes, it is ethical. Um, interestingly, we've got fewer people answering this one. And I think that that is because maybe some people aren't quite sure. And that's completely understandable. So again, if you need more information, put that kind of thing in the chat too, right? So what do we have? We've got loads of comments that have just come through. Um, where are we? This is because there is quite a few of them have come through, so I've lost my place. There we go. Uh, the quality of life of the detainees would never be the same after the interrogation. Like the point, I guess, to really emphasize is that we're talking about organ failure or death. That's extreme. So yeah, absolutely, it's going to affect their quality of life. I don't see how torture can ever be ethically justified for interrogation. Any confessions gathered are unsafe as people are under severe pressure to make the torture end, so maybe dishonest. Very interesting one there, because are we thinking that if the information gathered was more reliable, then it would be okay? Mm. And how do we judge that? That's, that's the thing. You know, there's, there's a really fascinating quote. I don't know if you can see it, Marie, that the last one in the chat is actually saying it is ethical because it's, the advice is given in accordance to the law. And I think that goes back to your earlier point about are we talking about the morality of the lawyer or the morality of the law? And I think that, that just ties yeah. together beautifully. And, and, and we will be coming on to that in a moment for yeah, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> it constitutes a severe... What do we have here? We have, I think I need a bit more information to answer confidently. Absolutely. I think that's really important to know. Um, but I answered no, as it al almost seems like it's trying to find a way around the international cat. I mean, 100% spot on. Yeah, <laughs> definitely trying to do some work around and, and Lucinda is going to come on to that in a little bit. Um, the problem with the memo, or the legal advice here, is that it emphasises on the intention of the interrogators, which of course may be manipulated and masked. Yes, absolutely. And if you have seen any reports around this time in history, in very recent history, um, some of these interrogators weren't the nicest of people. Um, and they were really quite distressing um things that happened to to people that we won't go into here um so definitely when we're thinking about the intentions of those people that's something to think about but, but it's also you know this idea that how many people you know turned a blind eye you know was the the, the you know just the, the emotional response of what happened in 9-11 did that just kind of erode 
our kind of moral compass, you know, were people just willing to kind of, you know, like we said, you know, to any other situation, you know, this is just morally unjustifiable, but the kind of environment, the political environment that, that, that everybody was in right then, you know, did that affect, you know, the, the response, the advice that was given and, and how lawyers were expected to, to respond to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we've, we've got somebody else here in, in the chat who said, um, how can you determine what their intentions are when inflicting pain? And uh, Lucinda is the resident expert when it comes to criminal law and thinking about intentions and how that can be determined. So I think Lucinda might be able to help us around intentions. Um, but I had similar thoughts when I was looking at these polls again earlier today, thinking, even if we're intending mental pain that is really extreme for a short amount of time, that still seems a little bit unethical to me. Still seems a little bit dodgy. I don't know. What do you think, uh, Lucinda, around the intention side of things? I think things? it's really difficult because I, I think we always assume that if you do, if you intend something for the right reason, then that's fine. But actually, in criminal law, motive it doesn't count. You know, motive is not. the same as intention so you can actually you know take someone's life for the best of intentions but that doesn't mean you don't have intention in criminal law so you know it's the motivations behind it which I find really interesting in this particular context you know these these lawyers they they were not evil men you know they they were trying you could argue to to respond to, to a situation but it's like how far you know again how far morally should you go when actually trying to act for, for your client? You know, the government says, look, the CIA says, you know, basically justify this for us. Were they in a position to say no? You know, that, that's the kind of thing that I find really interesting here. And I'm, I just looked at the time and my goodness, oh I know that we're, this is whizzing by. You've got carried away in this. Um, <laughs> but but some, somebody in the chat has said, and what constitutes as severe? And this lawyer has taken the worst case scenario, whereas uh, some other person might take something as a burn or a slapped wrist or something like that, you know? Um, and I think that that's a really interesting one because for here, they are trying to actually say, this is what severe is, right? And yeah. it's so extreme, it's organ failure and death. And Lucinda is gonna come on to it in a second as to like how they got to these things, which is just a bit, whoa. Um, but let's do our final quick poll, if that's all right, um, just before we move on. Um, which is, is this advice actually legal? Mm. It's an interesting one. You know, we're talking about the morality and ethics behind it, but can we even consider what they were saying as law? Can we actually even consider it as legal advice? You know, it's approved, approved by law. Okay, let's see what... I mean, certainly someone like David Lubin would question that, wouldn't he, Marie? You know, this idea of, of whether if it's not ethical, can it actually even be legal? So let's see what the poll brings up. Ooh. Uh, so, somebody in the chat um, to make us smile has says, it brings us back to the initial question of what it is and what it ought to be, <laughs> which I just think is wonderful. Uh, so we're very split here. We've we've gone we've gone basically 50-50. So 55% of us uh, say that it is legal, yes. Um, and 45% of us say no, it isn't legal. Um, and a uh, little bit of a difficult question for us to answer, I think, with so so little information. Um, but do you want to kind of elaborate for us then, Lucinda, in terms of how this all came about and was it legal? Well, I, I think to do that, if we'll just close this poll for a second, if that's okay, and if we could just go on to the next slide, I think that will kind of bring it into perspective. Now, we're kind of focusing on the position of David Lubin. And as we've said, he's a, a prominent researcher on legal ethics. And he was actually asked to testify about these, these memos. And he said, you know, in conclusion about the sort of advice that was given, he suggested that these conclusions range from the doubtful to the loony. And he said that, you know, the organ failure definition that, that Bybee provided 
was actually based on a Medicare statute. So a healthcare statute, you know, it had nothing to do with the law about torture. And in doing so, you know, Lubin says that something like this actually ridicules the idea of lawyering. So just to, to quote here, he says, the organ failure definition, perhaps more than any other portion of the Bybee memo, involved lawyering that cannot be taken seriously. It seems obvious that the Office for Legal Counsel lawyers simply did an electronic you know, Google search of the phrase severe pain in the United States Code and came up with the healthcare statutes, the only other ones that sort of dealt with um, the idea of, of severe pain. And then they decided to see how clever they could get. And the result is a parody of legal analysis. And I find this really interesting because I think it says so much about what lawyers do or what they're perceived to do. You know, everybody kind of has a view of lawyers. And I think this is this is really telling of this idea, you know, how clever can a lawyer be to sort of get their client off? And I think the fact here that in terms of trying to justify their decision, you know, it had nothing to do with any legislation, any law on torture. They basically just Googled, well, what is the, the Medicare? What does healthcare say about severe pain? That has nothing to do with what, go, what, you know, what was arguably going on at Guantanamo Bay. You know, how, how can we, you know, how was that justified? You know, and I just, you know, it's just really difficult to comprehend, I think. What do you think, Marie? Ab ab absolutely, and, and I think that one one of the interesting things that I'm just seeing in the chat here is uh, two completely different views with regards to whether or not these opinions are, are legal, which really ties into um, what what legal advice needs to be. Right. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we uh, can be thinking about when we're thinking about the Washington torture lawyers um, and everything that came out of this time um, is the ethics of legal opinions and what a legal opinion actually should be and what legal advice should be. Um, and we should, you know, just reiterate here before we go on to that point that um, it was actually found that Jay Bybee's memo was like fully not okay and so it did not stand as legal advice however that being said a number of further memos more legal advice was produced that wasn't as extreme as Jay Bybee's memo um, but did certainly allow for things that we would probably still feel quite uncomfortable with given what yeah. we have discussed already in today's session um, amongst us in the chat. Which is sort of quite interesting looking at the poll then, that actually there was kind of this 50-50 this split because actually it, it, you know, yes, that particular memo was not considered lawful or legal advice, but that didn't mean that others weren't. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it fully ties into what our understanding of legal advice is. So uh, two great opposing comments in the chat that I'm just going to read for us. So the first one is that I think it is legal to give them this advice. Because as horrendous as it is, you've given your opinion and have a duty to guide them. It's then their choice whether they follow it or not, right? Mm. And so one of the things there that we're highlighting in terms of digging down further into Jay Bybee's memo is that actually the advice given wasn't the way that legal advice should be given. Mm. And that's something that I'm going to come on to, to in a second. Um, and then somebody else, by contrast, has said the advice is not legal in the sense that it is political, for it determines the interests of the state rather than legal, which discusses the interests of upholding the law. Now, the comments that we're seeing here are of such a high standard in terms of how little information we've been able to give you in the context of an hour. So I'm really impressed by that. And again, that is us thinking about this difference between what the law is and what the law ought to be and how legal ethics can be involved in our understanding of what law actually is. And so one of the things that we could be thinking about is if I do something in compliance with the law that allows an outrageous thing to happen, is that still okay? Morally, is that still okay? 
and indeed legally is that mm-hmm. still okay and one of the things that you might come across in your legal studies if you do go on to study a law degree is um, a lot of discussions around Nazi law as a key example so if I follow something at that period of time that was legal however led to the deaths of hundreds thousands millions of people am I morally responsible for that am I legally responsible for that and and that's what we can be thinking about when we're thinking about the ethics of legal opinions here right so when we're thinking then about legal ethics and the ethics of lawyers there are standards that legal advice legal opinions need to meet and the memo that Bybee and others wrote were meant to be legal advice and not advocacy briefs. So when we're thinking about advocacy briefs here, we're thinking about you know, arguing as fully as you can for your side, because that's what lawyers should do. And David Lubin, who was thinking a lot about the Washington Torture Lawyers, suggests that actually perhaps the most fundamental rule of thumb for legal advice is that lawyers' analysis of the law should be more or less the same as it would be if the client wanted the opposite result from what the lawyer knows he wants. And so by that, what he's suggesting is that legal advice should do things like this, that it should lay out all of the legal arguments, not just the ones that were favoured by the parties at hand, should try to be objective in its analysis of the arguments. It should use cited legal authority honestly, so it needs to be reliable, none of this stuff that we've just seen with Medicare that Lucinda's has just been talking to us about. And it should also be clear about where it fits on the bell curve. So if it's a non-standard view, like if they're trying to really push things, they should be clear about that in the legal advice that they are given, otherwise it's not considered to be ethical. So one way that David Lubin puts this that we just think is a beautiful way of conceptualizing it is considering the lawyer as absolver so you know if I'm absolving someone of sin and he called this a CYA memo which is basically his idea that the torture memo is just doing this it is covering themselves so that they could avoid responsibility by saying that the lawyers had said that it was okay so for the person in the chat who was saying you know it was their choice whether they follow it they yeah so they they actively were putting pressure on the lawyers to do this stuff right because they wanted to cover themselves so for the legal ethics of opinion writing what is required is honesty objectivity and non-frivolous arguments regarding regardless of the subject matter and so not just trying to you know act as an absolver and, and trying to cover their their bums as it were um so generally um so Lubin then is here placing great emphasis on the honesty of the lawyers in writing legal opinions, but does acknowledge that that will only go so far because it does rely on the law itself not being cruel. And that's something that, you know, I'm touching upon there with thinking about Nazi laws and other laws that we could find examples of. But generally, societies these days, they do prohibit torture. They don't allow torture or cruel or inhumane degrading treatment. So writing then an honest legal opinion to allow for such acts as they did in stark contrast with a lot of the law of the time, um, therefore results in lawyers, as, as Lubin puts it, betraying their craft. So he considers this to be you know, a real high sin. It's very unethical and it should be avoided um, at all costs. And I actually, this, this kind of ties back into to what we want you to take away from this session is that, look, there were lots of theories and ideas around law and morality and legal ethics. But you know, what we want you to think about is, should there be a relationship between law and morality and law and ethics? And what kind of relationship should that be? And, you know, these are questions that, you know, they are relevant today when we consider, you know, just what Marie was saying, you know, what motivates the lawyer? Is it about the duty to your client? You know, if your client instructs you, you have to, you know, you have to follow them. And, okay, but what if your client isn't a particularly moral person? You know, are we asking lawyers to sacrifice their own principles in, in, in their duty towards their client? So if we think back to sort of the Bybee memo, you know, can we ever justify the sort of advice that was given on the grounds of, you know, public interest or even sort of political expediency? So, you know, how do we balance being a good lawyer and being a good person? 
And you know, what do we even understand by those terms? And it's these sorts of questions that you know we do try and explore in this in this course. You know, going beyond the philosophical discussion, and potentially the, the sorts of moral or, or ethical code that you as lawyers, you know, should potentially ascribe to when you're practicing. So it's these kinds of general ideas that we're we're sort of looking for from this from these sessions. It was going to happen at one point. Always got to happen. It was going to happen. It was going to happen. <laughs> I did unmute myself. Um, so if you want to, basically, this hour has gone super duper fast. And thank you all for joining us, right? Um, it's been a pleasure to speak to so many of you um, and to get such interesting insights. Um, so firstly, before I forget, there was a comment in the chat and I can't find it now because of how many um, comments there now are, which is great in and of itself um but somebody said about Kant saying um because Kant asks so this is Immanuel Kant and we're thinking about the lever example that we were discussing and whether a deontologist would ever allow like what would they do in that situation and they said because of the goodwill and needing to act of the goodwill isn't it a lose-lose situation um which is a great thought um, we didn't have enough time to go into Immanuel Kant's ideas, um, but Immanuel Kant does talk about similar kinds of things. And one of the examples that is used to explore that is the idea of a gunman coming to the door and um, basically saying, um, where's your husband? I want to kill him and he's got a gun and like, what do we do? This is the idea that is explored. And basically what the idea from Kant's viewpoint would be was that we shouldn't lie to the gunman to try and save our husband because if we lie that's a bad action in and of itself and we would then be responsible for the consequences of it whereas if we don't like we can omit the truth but we shouldn't actively lie and so a similar kind of thing I'm thinking he would do in this situation yes all of our acts need to be from a good will they need to be um uh, following the categorical imperative is what Immanuel Kant uh, would say um, but that doesn't mean that we would be responsible for the deaths of the people if we did not pull the lever it would however mean that we would be responsible for the deaths of the people if we did pull the lever and so we could talk about it at length but I would get the feeling that Immanuel Kant would say we shouldn't pull the lever um, but an excellent comment and an excellent thought. And I would just encourage everybody to read up a little bit more on Emmanuel Kant and what he's thinking around uh, uh, duty to think about that in more depth. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I answered that. So very, very quickly then, um, if you want to learn more about any of the things that we've been talking about um, today, uh, firstly, you can contact Lucinda and I, like we can chat to you and that would be wonderful. Um, a, an email will go out later on um, at some point to all of you who attended with this information here too. So we would recommend things like watching The Good Place. The Good Place is fantastic and has this whole lever scenario in it, Totally Google that, even if you're just it's going very to bloody, the, but it's really the scenario, because it's hilarious. Um, books, we mentioned David Lubin quite a lot today, and he's actually written a book on legal ethics and human dignity. He also was very interested in the Washington Torture Lawyer stuff. So if you follow that YouTube clip, he actually testifies before the House uh, Judiciary, Constitution, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Committee over in the United States about this very issue. And then the other thing I wanted to highlight is if you go onto that website, the Law Gazette, it is the Law Society's newspaper, basically, and they always post up to date news about who is getting into trouble and who is being investigated for all sorts of naughty ethical things. So um, if you want to keep up to date with those kind of information, I, I would recommend that you check out the Law Gazette. All of this information is going to be given to you um, in the correspondence that my colleague sends out after today's session, um, but you can find us on socials as you already know. And finally, we have, I believe, one more Summer of Law webinar coming up. The summer is going so fast. Um, and that's on intellectual property in the law, uh, which is next 
uh, week on the 21st of July at 2 p.m. Um, with our colleagues, Professor Elaine Potage and Dr. Jose Belido, uh, which will prove to be very, very interesting. So with that, thank you all so much for coming. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk at you for so long, um, but also for you to engage so well um, with the chat. It was really, really great to hear all of those uh, comments. and. I, for one, would be super excited to be learning with you next year if that is something that you were going to be doing. Um, but we wish you the very best of luck with whatever lies ahead for you. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>